All right, let's take a walk. First, make sure that you are on our free weekly newsletter. Uh, we send that out once, sometimes twice a week. You can sign up for free at quickmedia.com. That's C-W-I-C media.com. Right there at the top of the homepage, you can sign up for the newsletter. I write an article every week. Go to quickmedia.com, C-W-I-C media.com and get on that list. All right, a few things I want to talk about. They're all under the same theme here, and that is the theme of critique, or we might even call it tolerance to some degree. Way back in, in, in continental philosophy, going back to Kant, you have the critique, which really means something more along the lines of not as in critical thinking that we might think about it or analysis, but rather it's a breaking down. It is breaking down, and in German, really, the connotation at the time that Kant was using, to me, is much more along the lines of change. So it's breaking something down to change it. And then that moves into Hegel and, and, and others. And so that's really what we're talking about here. So I want to start off with identitarianism and, and talk a little bit about what's happening here based on surveys and numbers and some data. In a large survey that was done in 2021, we get some very interesting numbers here about the self-identification into the LGBTQIA plus group, right? Of traditionalists in 2021, that is the generation before the, the baby boomers, 0.8% identified as somewhere on the spectrum, the LGBTQ spectrum, 0.8%. Baby boomers, 2.6%. Gen X, 4.2%. Millennials, 10.5%. And Gen Z, 20.8%. Right, one More than one out of every five individuals in Gen Z identifies as someone being on the LGBTQ spectrum. Now, someone might say, well, I support the movement of identitarianism. And all this is happening is that people are feeling more comfortable about coming out. That is not true, right? This is a philosophy, it is a movement, and there is a contagion that is involved, especially with young women. And you'll see that as we go through the numbers here. Brown University, just recently, here in 2023, did a survey of their students. 38%, 38%, almost 40%, two out of every five, said that they were somewhere on the LGBTQ spectrum. Now, that's just two years later. Now, of course, that's at a an Ivy League school, so the numbers are gonna be higher. Why? Why would the numbers be higher at a college? Why are they higher at a an elite university? Well, indoctrination. That's part of it. It's partly a contagion. Again, you'll see what I'm saying here. Bisexuals made up the majority at Brown of those of those on the spectrum, about 38%. The majority, the vast majority of those that claimed to be, to be bisexual were women, right? College students that were women. There is more fluidity in, in, in sexuality with, with women than there is with men. But that is the bulk of the growth of this. It, it fits into all categories, but that is by far number one. And most of that is a social contagion. The studies have been done on this in circles, right? Friend circles and, you know, where it's not just one out of 10, one out of five, it's the entire group of friends that end up coming out as bisexual. You kind of retain a little bit of your gender identity and your sexuality by being bisexual, but you allow yourself to open up and to be a part of a growing movement. This goes along with what nationally is happening where you have 58%, three out of five individuals that claim an identity in the LGBTQ spectrum are bisexual. The vast majority of them that claim this are young women, teenagers, 20 and 30 somethings. And the other thing in looking at this is 
17% or almost one out of five claim to be unsure. They don't know, right? This is those at Brown University. So one in five students doesn't know where they fit. They don't know about their sexuality. This is about critique. This is about breaking down two primary areas, two primary targets. One is our self-identity. That's number one. And that's not to say there aren't gay individuals, the people that have same-sex attraction, people that feel they're born in the wrong body. All of that is true. That's not what I'm saying. But the movement is to break down identity, self-identity. And the second target is the family. It goes after the family. All of these movements of identitarianism, which would include feminism, radical feminism, which would include postmodernism and relative truth, all go after self-identity and the family. So what you have is a structure of a self-identity that needs to be broken down. It needs to be critiqued. And then once the belly is softened there, then you can infuse other ideas. That's what's happening. Secondly, you have a structure of the family, an order of, of what society would call a traditional family needs to be broken down. This has always been, since the very beginning, go back into the DNA, all the way back to Hegel, all the way back to many of the Marxists. It's the same idea, break down the family, raise the state, drop the family, right? You've got to replace the family with the state. We see this in our schools with parents. It happens over and over and over again. Now, let's go into critical theory. Critical theory is the same thing. We get critical theory from, really from Kant's term, critique. It is to break down and change. That's what this is about. Critical theory is basically Marxism 2.0 that comes through the Frankfurt School, developed in the Frankfurt School in the early 20th century, first half of the 20th century, by a group of Marxists. What do they do? What do they do with critical theory? What does it mean? Critical theory is the primary tenet or doctrine of the religion of academia. And what it does is it takes your worldview, critiques it, breaks it down, and replaces it with a filter that says there are in the world victims and oppressors, period. Victims and oppressors. And when you accept that, sounds crazy to be able to accept that, but people are doing it everywhere, left and right. When you accept that, you then are forced to take, make a choice. Am I a victim or am I an oppressor? Well, most people are going to choose the former, right? As bad as it is to be a victim, it's much worse to be an oppressor. And so they choose to be a victim or if they can't fit themselves into the oppressive or the, the victim category, then they will choose to be an ally. They will choose to advocate. They will choose to be a, an anti-racist or some type of ally that goes along with it so that they're not guilty of being an oppressor. And this is where, again, you get the primary movers and shakers in the culture outside of academia and inside of academia, but in the culture more broadly, the primary movers and shakers and those that are jumping into the movement of critical social justice and the religion of academia are white, middle-class and upper-class women. They are the ones that are going to be the most influenced. Studies show this. They are most influenced by guilt. And if guilt and shame are put in place, then they are going to run from that. And in order to do that, what you do is you join as an ally, right? You, you join as an advocate, you become an activist, and you can join in with the victims against the oppressors. The other thing that works very well is the unbridled compassion. And so those that are more compassionate, women are usually more compassionate. If it is unbridled compassion, then that is an easy, intoxicating draw toward critical social justice and the religion of academia. But when you have a choice between being a victim or an oppressor, 
and you choose victim, there's another duality that lays over the top, you can lay over the top of this. And that is ally and disciple. There was a good article written in Public Square Magazine last year, Jeffrey Thane, a couple of other authors, I don't remember their names, but uh, you know they're talking about allyship versus discipleship. And it's a very good duality. It's a very good way to look at this. I don't agree with a lot of what's in the article, but that view is very important because when you lay it over victim or ally and oppressor, what you end up with is the ally is the victim or an ally to the victim, and the disciple is the oppressor. So the disciple, the one following the doctrine of Christ, becomes the oppressor. This is another reason why when you look at this, it is very much against everything to do with the doctrine of Christ and with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, it's in com a complete antithetical worldview. And as an activist or ally, what you end up doing is having a heart that is focused on change, changing the systems, changing the people, changing the politics. Uh, and looking at the oppressors in the church. That's what ends up happening. And so your hope becomes a hope in change. Your hope is not as much in the doctrine of Christ and in looking at things internally and personally, where I need to change, I need to repent. We need to focus on a long-term compassion, real compassion, which is charity. Instead, it is I'm going to put my hope in a change, a change of getting rid of the oppressors, a change of the systems. And it's driven by an untethered, unbridled compassion and guilt and shame. And this brings us to Jesus. I talk a lot about the teddy bear Jesus. Teddy bear Jesus is only the first big iteration of the change of God into our own image or into the image of the world. It is what is done to soften the image of Jesus Christ, to soften the belly, so to speak, of the character and truth and order of Jesus Christ. So what you're doing eventually is you are trying social justice within Christianity. What it wants to do is critique Jesus, bring him first down to a, a, a position of a teddy bear Jesus a soft Jesus where there is no judgment, there are no consequences, forget about the commandments and truth, right? It is all untethered, unbridled compassion. That is the first iteration. But what is going to come in in its place, and it's already starting, is a bold, brash, political revolutionary. That is the next iteration that is coming. It is, we've removed responsibility now we're going to infuse a new purpose. It is going to be a liberation theology of Jesus Christ. It is going to be changing Christ into the image of the new religion of academia. You cannot have a different God with a different religion. So you have to change the God. And that is what is happening right now. It's already happening in LDS circles. I've seen this, I've seen books, um, I've, it's a very natural thing. I've studied this for 11 years. It's where it is going. It's part of critique. Break it down first, break down the image of God through making him a teddy bear Jesus and then infuse a new identity, a political revolutionary. You've seen this done in a number of different areas. For example, free speech. The free speech movement in the 60s and 70s started at Berkeley, the far left university. Why? Because the hegemonic forces did not want to hear the voices, the radical voices of the hard left Marxists from the universities. And so free speech was everything at the time. Well, now that those same individuals have pretty much completed the long march through the institutions, not just through academia. And hegemonically, they are the voice. They are the voice of the institutions. Now, free speech is no longer anything that they're supporting at all. 
right? What do they support instead? Hate speech. And hate speech now becomes the opposite of free speech. And so in order to control others and their voice, the second phase of the four phases of the priesthood that I cover, they push hate speech as a restriction on free speech. Everything is flipped on its head. It completely changes. We're going to break down the communication and the narrative that's out there. And then we're going to infuse a new narrative and a new force and a new regulation. That is exactly what has happened with speech. Another example of this comes at Sinai. And we usually don't look at this this way. But, you know, the golden calf and the partying and the dancing, when Moses goes up on Sinai, he comes back and he finds them worshiping the calf and partying and etc. right? That's a little bit of a sleight of hand. That's not what's happening there. I mean, it is, but the focus is pulled away from the fact that the Israelites, the children of Israel, denounce the higher law. They refuse to accept the idea of seeing the face of God and, the, and, and taking in the higher law. That's what Moses brought down the first time from Sinai, was the tablets of the higher law, the Melchizedek law, that would have been focused more on Jesus Christ and temple ordinances and other things, having a nation of priests. They rejected it. That is why Moses breaks the tablets and, and then has to go back up Sinai and get the new tablets, which are of the lesser law. And that is the law of Moses. Okay. So, but what happens with the calf is, is pretty interesting. When you read Deuteronomy or, or Exodus with this, you need to look at, at what the golden calf represents. When you read it closely, the golden calf is Jehovah. Golden calf is Jehovah. And that might sound crazy. It's an idol. Yeah, it's an idol. But think about what's happening. Moses goes up Sinai to meet with Jehovah, to come up to his terms, to bend his will to Jehovah's will. The children of Israel down below are doing the exact opposite, right? They're doing the exact opposite. They go down and they create this idol that is Jehovah. And so what they've done is they've taken Jehovah from the top of Sinai and brought him down to their level and created him into an idol that they can worship, man-made idol that they can worship. That is what liberation theology is. And that's what's happening with the first iteration here of a teddy bear Jesus. They don't, the children of Israel did not want the responsibility of the higher law. They did not want the consequences of the covenants. And so they made Jehovah in their own image and brought him down to the valley, so to speak, for them to worship. That's what must happen in Christianity when you mold together two different religions the religion of academia and the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. You have to change the God. And you should look for this because it is happening. Soften him up so that he can be molded so that you can, you know, burn the gold, so to speak, and soften the gold up. And then it, the gold becomes malleable and you can create him into your own image. Thanks for listening.